Hi, I'm Kelly Cooper. I'm the research agronomist at the Oaks Irrigation Research Site, right here where we're at in near Oaks, North Dakota. And standing next to me is my old buddy and pal, Joe Brecker. Joe farms, well, tell them where you farm at, Joe. I farm 30 miles straight east of here. Straight east, 20 miles straight east of my place. <laughs> yeah. We kind of grew up together. Well, we did grow up together. We did grow up together. Went to high school, went to college, and then eventually, Joe got me into conservation work, which is a long story. It is. But to get to the point, get to our subject today of 60 inch corn, or more specifically, wide row corn, right? Wide row corn, right. Yeah, yeah, so we're just remembering in uh, February of 2019, phone rings, I pick it up, it's Joe, and he says, I got a crazy idea for you, Kelly. I said, what's that? 60 inch corn and well 60 inch high no 60 inch wide corn rows <laughs> and that everything has gone to narrower corn rows over the period of time and we talked a little bit about it i think it was where where did it come from uh, i was at a university uh cap grant meeting that maris alberti had put together and uh, a gentleman from iowa uh who was working with the professional farmers of Iowa uh, doing some work on wide space corn. Uh, and he was telling me some of the things he was seeing. Uh, and the thing that caught my ear was uh, the biomass that they were able to grow between the wide rows of corn uh, and not affect significantly affect the corn yield or at all affect the corn yield. So um, that was like, because we had been trying uh, with, with Abby Wick, Dr. Abby Wick, we'd been trying interplanting uh, our corn uh, with cover crops in 30 inch rows and with modest, well actually less than modest, modest success. And uh, the, the corn, the competition from the corn was actually out competing the cover crops. So it's kind of like, okay, it's working, not really working, where do we go from here? And when, he, when that gentleman told me that, uh, that the cover crop stayed alive, not only stayed alive, but actually uh, was a significant portion of the biomass in the field, that was like light bulb, you know, time. And uh, I had to, had to try it on my farm. And, and now you've, I got you going on yeah, it. Yeah, so. yeah. I, you know, after that phone call, I had to sit there. I still thought it was a crazy idea but I, I got to thinking about our plot equipment and I realized we could actually do this. It would be in a small scale. So, uh, so anyway, in 2019, we did a couple, three plots, just kind of demonstration. And, and of course, from a conservation point of view, this is just wonderful that you can get this cover crop in the floor of your corn crop and it does all those wonderful conservation things, like it keeps the soil in place, stops soil erosion. Um, it adds diversity, which we all like that, a diversity of plants. Now, there is a challenge with weed control, right, Joe? Uh, absolutely, and, and that's the part that I'm still going through on my own farm. I'm, I'm looking at it day to day. I'm seeing some really interesting things, though, is that as long as there is cover crop there, the weed, the weed component doesn't seem to be any different uh, there than it really is in narrow row corn or standard row corn. Uh, if there's not a cover crop to compete with it, then that's when you can have significant weed issues that are quite mm -hmm. robust. Yeah, and what, what I found here, I, uh, without going into great details on herbicides, apparently if you give the herbicide a couple of weeks, you can plant a lot of these cover crops in and not, and not have any really big effect on, uh, on the cover crop. In fact, last year we were amazed at how vigorous, especially the buckwheat, the tame buckwheat. I mean, we had buckwheat four to five feet tall uh, in our corn with a lot of pollinators. Um, and it, and it, we ended up with about a 5% yield hit. So there was a slight yield hit. But, but it wasn't because of the cover crop. No, no, we had cover crop and no cover crop, and they yielded, they yielded the same. 
and we had 30 inch corn and we had 60 inch corn, same variety, planted the same day. Now this wasn't replicated, it was more demonstration. We had very similar yields, a little bit less on the 60 inch corn. So we're, we're quite encouraged. So this year we, uh, we did actually two full replicated studies here at the Oaks research site. One is looking at 30 inch versus 60 inch north-south planted versus east-west. Now this is, you know, when you're dealing with these wide row corn, uh, the sun is going to hit the north-south and the east-west a little bit differently. Different times of the day, for sure. Yep, so that may change the cover crop that you have. Um, it may change the variety of the corn that you're looking at. They talk about corn that's more upright leaves versus wider leaves. So there's a lot of little nuances, I think, that at the research site that we can tease out. But now, uh, Joe, tell them a little bit about your planter. Joe got so excited, he built his own planter this spring. So, so based on the single row 60 and the work that we were able to look at, whether we we're searching Twitter for people that had, had limited experience with it or not, but there appeared to be, uh, if you put more rows, even wide, but so I went with, I decided to try pair row 60 inch. So I could not find a toolbar uh, that I could just buy off the market and put my row units at various widths because I wanted to try from eight inch down to single row. And uh, so I ended up this winter working with a local weld shop and we put together our own toolbar and it worked out great. So I bought uh, precision row units to put on this toolbar and uh, had a great planting season. And the first field I planted, I, I have passes throughout the field that are eight inch pair row, eight inch 60, right? Or centered on eight inch, uh, I, sorry, centered on 60 inch spacing, but the pair rows are eight inches apart. Then I went to six inch, four inch, two inch and single row like you have behind us here yeah, this is for, for comparison purposes. And the, the entire purpose of it is so that I can decide which one to kind of settle in on. Do I, is eight row higher, eight inch pair row higher yielding than four inch pair row? How do they harvest? How, how does the, when you start spacing the rows back out, there is a difference on the shading for the cover crop. Um, now, I, as long as the cover crop survives, I am not quite as concerned about how much biomass I produce. I just want it to be a, a even growth and uh, uh, have it be so that my overwintering species, like for example, in my mix this year, I have rye and alfalfa. I want them to establish, survive the winter and come up next spring. Uh, and in the in the 30 inch corn where we had interseeded uh, years previous, several years previous, uh, the corn in a lot of cases actually reduced the stand. I mean, almost to zero at, at, at times. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really want there to be just enough light in that canopy to get the cover crops to establish, grow and survive if, if they're overwintering species. Um, I, I think that there's if you were somebody that was looking to maximize the uh, cover crop biomass that you were planting in there, then you might want to, you know, play with those row widths, right? Right. Right. And maybe corn types and leaf types and all yeah. of that. Because Joe used to have cattle, but you don't anymore. But there's a lot of livestock uh, people that are very interested in this system because of the aftermath grazing potential where you could really enhance not only the quality of feed, but the duration uh, of the time. And, and you, can, you can play around again with this. This gives an opportunity for spring calving. You could have the cover crop over winter. You've got a nice place to turn your cows out to calf. Um, we, last year with our first 60 inch corn experiment, we planted an 82 day corn June 3rd and June 6th. Now remember, this was last year when about 
half the corn in North Dakota in areas didn't even get harvested. Right. And our 82 day corn did mature. So it, it, you know, it's a one year, a one time thing, but it just shows you can grow corn, early day corn in Southern North Dakota where we're at, and you can mature the corn, but you could still utilize some of these cover crop opportunities. So, uh, so one of the things we were talking about uh, was the weed control aspect of it. And, and that, you know, that is paramount, I see. When I, when I talk to producers about widening those rows out, one of their first questions is, yeah, but what about weed control? Mm -hmm. and, and certainly, uh, we, you have to go through a series of experimental phases through this to discover uh, what, what you're going to settle in on. But I agree with you, what you com comment, you said that there, there, there are opportunities to pick the cover crops and still use uh, residual herbicides that will give you uh, longer into the season. I, mm -hmm. I venture to say there probably isn't anything that's full season weed control without Correct. canopy, right? Correct. But if you can get a long enough season weed control to get your cover crops to help with that canopy, then it looks like really weed control is, is attainable mm -hmm. in these wide space corn scenarios. Yes, but it's gonna take some practice. Yes, it is, it's practice and, and experimentation, right? Right, right. So, uh, so we ended up, like I said, we've got two replicated studies here at Oaks, and one is the one I mentioned with the north-south uh, population. Another one is a variety trial, it's dry land. We planted it just like our 30 inch trial, but it's in 60 inch. And then we've got six demos. Uh, one is a 30 inch, 60 inch strip till. Now, that's another dimension into this. I think, Joe, you're all no-till with your planter, Correct. right? Right. And, and some people like a little tillage, some people like strip till. So we had a strip till machine that we could utilize and we took every other row unit off so we could do 60 inch strips. But Kelly, and we, we can come back to this, I am strip tilling but with plants. Yes, yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to we'll that. We'll come back to We'll that. come back to that, because that's, that's really unique, and with fertilizer. Yeah. Um, but we've got a paired row, single, single row 60s, paired row 60s with two different varieties. We have a, uh, a cover crop demo that right behind us here. We've only got like three different cover crops, uh, but we're looking at that. And then we, we did have some 60 inch corn last year. So we strip tilled through that and kept going through some conventional corn. So we want to see if there's a difference where you have that wide row corn, if the next year corn actually does a little bit better than where it's going into the corn residue. And then uh, kind of a fun one, I've got a, a weed patch. Now we've been talking about how weeds can be a problem well, I had an area that was full of dandelions. It was basically sod. So we went in with 60 inch corn on that. And because this corn is so wide, I can drive a four wheeler between it. So it gives me the opportunity to use several different herbicides through the season quite easily. That you couldn't use or Would couldn't be use difficult. as easily in a narrow right, row. Okay. Right, so we'll, so we'll see how, uh, how that turns out. But, but yeah, tell us about your... Uh, so, um, our history, Kelly and my history, really uh, after in our adult life uh, got, uh, got really interesting when we started a group of farmers, started a research farm at Foreman, North Dakota called CCSP. And Kelly was the manager of our uh, research farm at Foreman. And one of the things that came by trial and error, basically, was using cover crops planted after cereal grain harvest uh, and planting them in rows intended to be planted back on the next year. And that system became known as, by us, as bio strip till. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a process that Kelly, working at CCSP, came up with. And then I was so intrigued by it because I really, I'd done strip till since the late 80s, early 90s with tillage, mm -hmm. I, uh, I saw the benefits of, the, of it, but I also saw, saw the downside at times, like, you know, if you have any slopes, 
and you have some heavy rains, you can get washing down that furrow, down that tillage of, row. A lot of erosion. Sometimes, you know, if you don't get your tillage done in the fall and you're forced to do it in the springtime, you, you don't always have ideal conditions, but yet you're kind of forced to because that's your system. So uh, when, when, when Kelly came across this, this uh, use of cover crops in line with next year's corn, it just all of a sudden, again, it's one of those kind of light bulb moments. Uh, we need to do some work with this. Mm -hmm. So I took that concept to my farm and I've been experimenting with different plants in a row to follow my corn back with. And one of the things that we started out, we had radish as where the corn followed uh, and had the peas in between because we had discovered already that peas can be difficult the next spring because of their vininess and stringiness and planting them in between the rows, they were less trouble. But I, I have uh, since switched to a faba bean. And what I found with faba bean is when they die, they have a chocolate brown residue mm -hmm. and no vininess whatsoever like peas. They just die and fall apart on the ground, uh, very dark in color. And it influences the temperature in that band that you're planting your corn in. Absolutely. So, yep. uh, so that's what I'm, I've been doing the last two or three years, and it really does seem to work, and I, I love it. It's, it's my strip-till mm -hmm. version of bio strip-till, right. and I, I get not only the benefit of the warming of the ground from it, but uh, I can still stay true no-till. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then cut that erosion. And cut that erosion. Don't have that risk right. involved in it. Right. So it's awesome, hmm. so far. God, how many trials do you have on your own farm with your new planter? You've got... So, so I, what I'm testing this year is the one field is just testing the width of the pair rows down to single row. Um, I have a field that I have a 30 inch planter, uh, a, a cousin that came in with their 30 inch planter. So I have replicated uh, comparisons of 30 inch versus pair row 60. Um, I did another field on my farm where I actually moved over 30 inches with the same planter, reduced the population in half, and I have pair row 30 hmm. versus pair row 60 at the same population, same variety, hmm. you know, everything's the same. Uh, and then I have two neighbors that left me places in their 20 inch plantings hmm. to come in with my twin row hmm. 60. So lots of comparisons, yeah, and, lots of things to look at come And home. Joe, do you have any idea how many farmers are trying wide row corn across North Dakota? Um, no, but I can think off the top of my head of, of at least probably a dozen that are doing some level of ex experimentation with wide row corn. And there may be many more than that. Yeah, I, I've been surprised uh, last winter this thing really kind of took off. I was surprised at the interest. I think I had more interest in this project than any other project I've ever ever done in the conservation or at the field trials. A lot of phone calls, a lot of Twitter followers. It just, and it's people, it's livestock people, it's conservation people. Some are just curious, but I, I think between what we're doing at the research site here, what Joe was doing, I know Eddie County has, uh, has a research project. I, I think this winter will be very interesting that we'll have a lot of data to share. I think we'll have a lot of stories. Uh, I believe we will. So, uh, and, and Abby, I believe, is going to have something at the DIRT uh, conference. Yeah, so hopefully she's able to have the DIRT conference. Yeah, right? yeah. or it may be virtual. Or maybe it's virtual. She's, <laughs> she's still in that planning process. So, so anyway, we're hopeful. We're hopeful we can learn something and uh, we can increase conservation, diversity, and uh, hopefully help the livestock guys too. And at the end of the day, Kelly, it's really all about soil health. That's right. That's right. right. It's more plants. Uh, remember that goal we talked about about what 15 years ago now? Live root, 360 yep. days a year. Yep, and we can get there with this system. That This is one of the components that we were missing before. Exactly. All right, well, thanks, Joe.